All right, SEO for series, SEO for bloggers. More specifically, search engine optimization for bloggers. What, why, and how writing works. Thank you for joining and being in the room with me today. I'm excited that you are here and we are going to use this time to really break down some things that can kick off, you know, a good start for you, which is where we want to think about businesses. And this is something that I would love to connect with you on today because today is a really blessed day. It's a Friday to start with, so happy Friday. And I know you've been listening to all the series on you know the different options, the different topics, the different examples, the different shows, the different you know episodes that allow you to understand better how to approach marketing. And this is one of those rooms that you definitely do not want to miss when it comes to marketing and you know having your services and building your services for the right people, right? So. These are the times that we're in that we have to think about creating content for people, but at the same time, creating content in a way that people can actually understand how it works. And the business part of this, especially when you think about a, a blogger, a writer, there are a lot of things that you have to consider. So I'm not even going to talk about you know, the writing. Yes, I will. But more importantly, I'm going to be focusing on the technical side. So when you do show up as a writer, you can actually really do it well, you know, and do it with the kind of positioning that actually gives you, you know, long term results. So give me a few seconds and we're going to get this started. Welcome, Memo. Welcome to the room. I love your picture. That's really a nice picture. Thanks for joining the room today and I hope you're okay. Happy Friday. Give me a second. This is going to be good today. This is going to be good today. All right. I'm just writing this down because I want people on threads to come and join us, actually. So if that's something that will be happening, oh, yeah, I'm totally in for that. So I just posted it away. All right, here we go. All right. So. I'm excited about today's topic because I know that when we start to build and create content and also grow our content, we're doing this as a response mechanism that allows us to, you know, get more people through the door and also get more activity, you know, for our websites, for our social medias, you know, for things to just germinate you know, connect, plant, build, grow. There are a lot of things that we have to look at as a business, especially when you're creating time for information, for pieces, for things that you naturally do. And if you naturally do some things, there's some things you have to take care of, right? So the one of the things you have to take care of as a business is writing, communication, visual, you know, learning, understanding the concept, messaging, you know, these are things that don't just happen overnight. They happen over time. So when you are building connections with people and you're growing, the growth starts from knowing who you're connecting with, to what capacity, at what level, and then writing based on competition, right? When you write based on competition, you're able to write based on value, family, you know, lifestyle, food, travel, humor, anything that's going to give you those, you know, juices that you're looking for. So that comes from the writing piece, you know, from the elemental part, from the essential beginning of how you're able to connect those dots. So we're going to talk about that today. Welcome, David. Welcome to the room. It's going to be a room today that will help you understand how to write your blogs right and and i wanted to you know just find out from you how you can 
build your business from the ground up. Welcome, Austin. And use blogging, writing, piecing things together that would give your business more accuracy. And when we talk about accuracy, I'm talking about people who are searching for your content that will find your content that will easily connect with you at a large scale because you're addressing questions that they're having, right? When you're addressing those questions, those questions come with time, right? Those questions come with decision-making. It comes with a lot of you know, resilience. It comes with a lot of building. It comes with a lot of thinking. That thinking piece is also very important to discover because as a business, especially when you're writing content, you have to understand that when you're doing SEO for blogs or when you're just doing SEO period as a writer, the website copy, if you really want to think about the word blogs, we can even throw away the word blog and say, you know, SEO for web. We can put it like that because it changes how people see it, but I want to, you know, specify on the the blogging piece that you can write good web copy. Because if you can write good blogs, then you can write good web copy. You know the page structure. You know how things work. You know where to put a heading, where to put a, a button, where to put a, a link. Uh, you know a numbered list. Those are things that happen when you write articles. When you put a quote, when you put a design, when you put an image when you upload. So imagine when you're building that web page, right, for that blog, the way you're structuring it, the videos you're putting there, the codes you're putting there, the schema you're putting there, all those things that you're putting together are all working to your advantage, right? And why are they all working to your advantage? It's because they are working together to build resonance in the form of understanding where your content can stem from, especially when you start thinking about your business long-term in the sense of discovery, from the point of discovery, right? When you want to discover something, you're going to discover it based on what you know, based on base knowledge, right? Based on first time hearing. So when you are basing this knowledge and you're going to ask more questions on how to understand more, you know, insights on how to get more topics, how to get more questions, these are the things that you have to look at because when you're writing content, you're writing content for two things or two essentials. You're writing content for people and you're writing content for the bots or you're writing content for the algorithm. Let's put it like that. When you're writing for these two very important sets, right? You're looking at it from a technical point of view, which is HTML and XML, right? HTML is what we all see. That's what we all click on. When you click on a link in your email, when you click on a link on, on social media, when you click a link on your website, anyone's website, any blog, any product, Amazon, wherever you go, those links are HTML links. That stands for hypertext. So when they say hyper, it just it's it's kind of like elevated, if I can put it that way. It's beyond just the basic text. Now it's hypertext because now I can see it. It turned from black to to blue. You know when you use like a back in the day when you use a, a blue pen or blue marker, and then you use a red marker. When you see a red marker on your paper, <laughs> it tells you you're about to get a score or you're about to get a grade. You know, you get that kind of feeling with the colors, right? Because it's hyper texted, if that makes sense. If I wrote that same word to you in black text, right, would it have the same effect if I wrote it in red text, right? So the way you show up online has to match up to those things that are being seen on the hypertext section. So hypertext is the color, is the link, is the, the the building, the link building, right? You create a word, 
you put a word in there, you put a link on top of the word, and then you send the link with the word to people's socials to see, to click on in their emails, right? So you've created a pathway, right? Welcome Liverpool's finest. You've created a pathway for people to hear you, to see you, work with you, to learn from you, to read with you, to even hear your experiences. Like with podcasts, it's good to tell stories because people get to learn more about you in between the topics they came to learn about, right? So when you add those things, it also gives you that credibility because yes, they want to learn information, but they also want to learn who they're talking to. They want to learn who they're listening to, who they're reading from. So those are your network flavor. You're in the matrix. I don't know if it's just me, but your network is terrible. Just can you hear me, Raver? Yeah, it's not. I thought it might have been my network, but it it definitely coming from your end. Okay, that's. I probably have to maybe check that. Hey, David, can you hear me okay? Have I been cracking on your yeah, end too? Um, we can hear you now, Maver, much better now. I think to be much better now. Yeah, you, you're, you're sounding way better. Uh, earlier, you were cracking quite a bit. Was it the whole time or just a little time? It was a little, it was a little time, it was a little time, it was a little time. Okay, thank you. Sometimes I want to make sure that you guys can you know, hear me well, because if you don't just put in the chat or let me know so that I'm not, you know, missing out on anything. So you have to think about how you're writing, what you're writing, who you're writing for, and also build your writing based on community, right? So when you're building your content, when you're building your website you're building it with those words with those images with those videos that's what people are going to see so what why and how writing works is when you decide to take your information give it to somebody else in form of a video in form of a podcast in form of a text something that is going to let someone know that hey i understand what you talked about and you were able to relate the message and it was good and i thank you so much for sharing that you know when you think about content and speaking to people you don't know who you're really speaking to because most times when we speak out think about it when you make a speech or when you do a presentation the only people that come back to you or give you feedback are the people who directly come back to you right or want to talk to you after your presentation or after your your speech right but the ones who don't come back to you or don't say anything had something to say but they didn't just tell you right it might be good it might not be so good but they have an opinion which is their right right so when you have something to say and you put it out there to people most times they're not going to give you feedback if you send an email to a thousand people don't expect a thousand people to respond back it just doesn't work that way right it could for you that's you know that's lottery ticket right that's great but still you have to maintain that relationship you have to build that relationship and how i'm even saying this to you is because this morning i was talking to one of uh the people that used to work with us um two years ago and her name is Juliet, and she's really doing amazingly well. When she left, she was like, yeah, I want to bring somebody on board and replace her. She kind of replaced herself with somebody else. And it's been a great, you know, it's just been a great journey as well with her. And I talked to her today and from nowhere, it was just random because I was talking to her, the, the person that she introduced me to, Beverly, because I was talking to Beverly. We were doing some podcast editing for a client. and. We were like, okay, let's let's get this this thing done. Let's get it scheduled. 
And then she heard me in the background. It's like, hey, favor a long time. I was like, what? what? What are you doing over here? So we started talking. And then from nowhere, we're not even talking podcasts. I was saying, how are you? How is your family? Like, I'm literally going straight at, hey, long time no see. Then from nowhere, she's like, hey, thank you for to talking about that podcast with health and hearts. And I'm like, what? Healthy? Okay. So I thought about it and it wasn't, it didn't click till she said it. Seconds after, I was like, oh, that's what you're talking about. Cause I did an episode. If you guys click the link above, you'll see it in the we don't play podcast.com show. You'll see that there's an episode where I featured three people, um, two, a couple and a doctor and they're holding an annual gala in they're holding an annual gala in October, you know, to support, you know, people to support children, you know, who haven't been able to get an open heart surgery and they're raising funds and donations for that cause. So we wanted to like, you know, draw back the curtain and talk about why it's important, what's going on, you know, who are is in, who is being impacted, how can we help? So we did that episode and we published it. That was like a week ago, right? Earlier this, yeah, last week, about, yeah, about a week ago. And I'm today, a week later, I'm getting a response from her saying, thank you so much for sharing that episode. You know, it, it was really touching to know these things because, you know, it's very important to understand where we are. Hey, Heather, you know, so looking at these things allows us to understand the volume that we are actually producing when we're connecting with people at a large scale because people won't tell you they listen to your podcast they won't tell you they they listen to your they read your blog hey i read your blog every day you're not going to hear that every day if you hear that at least once in a year you're very lucky because not everyone gets to hear that right because people keep their opinions to themselves people sometimes if they want to tell you something they'll say something so you have to think about how you also respond back and if you put out content and it goes out there and people are listening, that's a great thing. She's all the way in a different country and she listens to podcasts. Other people in other countries have been listening to it. I don't know what they've said, but I know that their lives are being touched because when I look at the analytics, I see that people are listening. The downloads are going crazy. So I know, okay, people are listening. So that helps me to know what to bring and how people are listening, how they're learning. It's not just about SEO, SEO, SEO. Without life, there's no SEO, right? So we have to think about those things. And that's why I also bring some of those things to the picture. And it's very interesting to see how I get those feedback. So this is for the people. And that's why blogging is important because we write away, we write experiences and we write for the people. So I'm glad that we're here today. Heather, we'd love to hear from you. Welcome, happy Friday. What are your thoughts on the topic? Happy Friday, everybody. Um... SEO for bloggers. What, why, and how writing works? I mean, if you have a blog, I applaud you because <laughs> it is so hard for me to keep up with my own blog. Um, I've had a blog for God started 15 years ago, but I haven't posted anything. But I will say, I do blogs for my clients, and because, like, I'm sorry, like, I just. <laughs> I'd rather get paid for, <laughs> for blogging than just do it for myself and not make check. But um, blogging is really good attraction marketing. Um, and I actually just had a podcast episode yesterday called Modern Marketers uh, for my podcast called Dark Mode. I'm actually working on that right now on my computer. I'm going to upload that to YouTube and Spotify, hopefully today. Um, but we were talking about attraction marketing and blogging is such a great way to utilize attraction marketing and coupling the SEO portion of it adds that longevity of the attraction marketing because you're known as like a thought, quote unquote, thought leader. I hate that word so much, but you're, you're seen as, as an authority, right? Um, because you're writing about a specific topic on your blog. You're maybe you're even sharing your personal life, which can create trust in your brand. So attraction marketing and blogging is really good, but I will say, and I'm going to give everybody a little tip here, go over to ChatGPT and use ChatGPT to help you optimize your blog posts for SEO. So the perfect way to do this is you'll take your blog post and you'll copy your whole entire blog, your whole entire blog post, even if it's like 500 words, bro, like just go put it in chat GPT and just like copy paste and then don't hit enter yet, but hit like shift enter, enter 
to add a prompt below the blog post that you're adding in and say, um, I am uploading an entire blog post that I wrote about, I don't know, let's say like uh, the top five burgers in Delaware. I just wrote a blog about the top, top five burgers in Delaware. I need you to optimize this with the keyword burgers in Delaware and also create a meta description based off of the blog post, keeping it under a hundred characters and an optimized blog title based on the content. And it'll create a meta description and a meta title for you, but also optimize the copy of your blog because you need to make sure that you have a specific amount of keyword density within your blog post to help boost your SEO. So just think about how you can utilize ChatGPT and AI to help you optimize your blog posts to help you, I don't know, with better attraction marketing on your website. So, okay. Thanks, Favor. Love this combo. Thank you, Heather. That's so great. You know, that subject matter expert is a big thing because you, you're constantly showing up for things that happen within your business. You know, you're writing content daily for people who are looking for information that you provide in a service that they need because you're in the same industry, you know, setting. So like you said too, when you're creating content for people, that content has to resonate with them. If it's not resonating in the first three seconds, first 10 seconds, even the song that you love listening to, if it's not resonating, if the hook doesn't hook, then it's not hooking. You know, you're not there because it's not attracting, it's not getting your attention, it's not getting any type of retention, and it's just, I'll call it suspension. That's what I would call it because you're just stuck. You're in this whole status quo that you can't move past because you've written one topic and you can't write past that one topic, but you can actually write around the topic. So if you say, let's say, like you were talking about the comprehensive guide to, let's say, social media marketing for travelers for travel agents, you know, for example, now I'll give you a full guide. Welcome Kyoko. Welcome Ehab, Fran and Soma. You have a full list, right? A full comprehensive guide on a blog about one thing. Now, if you take that blog and then you create sub blogs for that one thing and lead all, let's say you have five different strategies you can have five additional strategies right five additional web pages for five different strategies to support right that one comprehensive article and when you create articles one of the greatest things that i've seen that work and it's so underrated because i want to hear your thoughts on this too heather and also david liverpool as well and anyone can go first. Table of contents. It's so underrated, especially if you anchor your table of contents in a way that if someone clicks on it, it will anchor them right to that section of the page. And even doing that with your videos, with your chapters, with your podcasts, with your chapters, you know, creating those experiences that if somebody wants to go through a two hour video, but you have 10, 15 timestamps, someone feels comfortable to say, okay, I want to listen to this part of the, the, the topic so I can learn more about this big, you know, video. What are your thoughts on that? So essentially I love that because, and you're talking about like table of content. So let's say like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, but they're all linked to when you click that link, it goes down to that section. That is very smart because it helps people number one, navigate to that section, which decreases bounce rate. Because let me tell you, I hate when like I'm, let's say like you have like a, a blog post and you have a recipe at the bottom. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who puts at the top, click here to go directly to recipes so I can skip all that crap. Because like sometimes I get so frustrated when I'm trying to find an answer within a blog post and I, it doesn't have those clickable links. I'm out of there. And that will actually increase the blog posters bounce rate, which is not good for SEO. So I love that fact, number one. And then number two, it actually helps keep people interested and engaged because let's say that, okay, I just want to learn about chapter three and chapter eight. And so I'm just going to be able to click on chapter three and go down there immediately and get the information that I need 
instead of having to look through everything. And then third, it's a signal. You clicked on something. You clicked on a, you clicked a link within that page. So that is a, a signal in itself that you are taking action on that page, which actually you can get and gather more data because you're clicking on that link hierarchy that you created on that page. And so you can see who's clicking what and see what chapter is most like popular. And then maybe you can even do a spin-off of that for content, another blog post specific to that, or even create a video using that analytics. So that's a, I love it. I love those little links. And thank you again to everybody who puts the link at the top to get me down to the recipe. Hey, you know what I'm saying? It feels so good. Cause when you do something like that, it's, it's what Google calls helpful content, you know? it's helpful. Like if I'm helping you and I'm giving you a hand, I'm not going to give you a 2000 word article and not give you a table of contents. I'm not going to give you like some type of anchoring, some type of page structure. Okay. Here's a title. Here's a subheading. If I just give you basic text and just paste the whole text there, first of all, your eyes are going to hurt. Then you're going to leave. And then you won't come back because you remember why your eyes hurt in the first place. And you don't want to have that a second time. So that helpful content piece that Google has, is HCU helpful content update that Google made. It's according to these things, have anchor text, have FAQs, have infographics, create your content and build your content from the ground up. Use AI images to help you. I'm going to be doing a workshop in September. I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about it, but I said August was not the right time. So September will be the right time for it. I'm going to do a workshop on, on AI images and how you can actually optimize AI images to get attractive, like Heather was saying, attractive marketing. And it makes sense. And right now, when I did some research, like within the, the whole marketing sphere, I realized that a lot of people in the marketing industry now, especially articles, bloggers, yes, they use stock photos. But what's becoming of, uh, of a really cool thing to see now is AI images that are being represented in your newsletters, in your articles, within your blogs, within your PSAs. It's really good to have AI images, but also you need to know how, right? Cause some AI images you can look at can be so boring that you just wanna leave, right? And the response, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm getting the red bar. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. It was a little bit jumpy um two minutes ago so everything that you said it would clear a bit quite jumpy um yeah for two minutes okay all right i want to make sure i don't miss out on anything all right i'm also on the lookout for that so yeah when you when you look at those parameters those are the major 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 things to look out for because when you start to put out those little drops in the ocean, FAQs, glossaries, um, related articles, infographics, you can do all those things. And with AI images to support them, it's such a great thing to use, right? There's an AI platform I use even for my podcasts. I'm gonna tell you all about it because it's something that is free. And, but how to use it is, is that's where, I mean, you can always use a toolbox, you know, but how to use it, you have to know what you're using it for. So you can always have it, you know, in, at, the, at the palm of your hand. So it's called Ideogram, right? And they just created a, a 2.0. Heather, have you heard about it before? Okay. So this tool, they even have, they just launched their, it's in the App Store too. This thing is crazy. Think about Unsplash. If Unsplash and Canva had a baby, it would be Ideogram. Because Ideogram literally takes your idea and turns it into an image that is so photorealistic that you'll actually enjoy. They have options. You can either create anime, design, 3D. If you want to do realistic images, you know, change the theme, the model, it's up to you. And they, they have so much powered, powered, powered operations. If you think about the way they're building, and you think about how they're actually focusing on generating content. This is one of the, the very few AI image enhancer platforms I've seen out there. There are two I know that really do super well. This is one of them. And 
if you look at my podcast, even if you click the link above here, all the images you see there were auto-generated by this platform, but I had to prompt it. I needed to say a few things, make sure that it looks good, it looks clean, it makes sense. And now they just released um, 2.0, right? And you get four images. So one credit gives you four images. Not a lot of platforms give you four images or four variations of your prompt, right? So this one does that, right? And they just created a 2.0 version. And in this version, they focused on accuracy in text. So you know how when you use AI and you tell it to say something and then it gives you an image with the wrong letter or the wrong you know, phrase, or maybe they add a letter or remove a letter. This one gives the exact phrase. Whatever you typed in that box is exactly what you get in the image. So I don't know what's going to happen to Canva because the way these guys are doing it, it's crazy. Like I would say I want a photo of a cartoon in form of this, looking for that, and I'll get exactly that. And that's an image. Why I'm giving guys this AI stuff now is because I've also seen an increase on my website as far as impressions. The bounce rate has gone low. It still goes lower. You know, you can never go up. I don't know how low can you go, but you can keep going low, low, low. And the reason why is not just because the content is what they signed up for. They searched and said, hey, I'm looking for SEO tips and they get my article. On top of that, they're staying a little longer because the images look so good that it's like you're walking into a museum. You just want to stare at this image for another 30 seconds before you walk away. And that that watch time, that screen time is calculated. If you do that in your emails, if you do that in your YouTube thumbnails, if you do that with your podcast thumbnails, if you do that with your YouTube, your, your blog thumbnails, you will go so far. It's been working for me for this quarter and I've been doing it. Other people are doing it now with theirs and they're like, yeah, they're seeing the results. So it's those little things that go a long way. Yes, Heather. Okay. I got to say something. Um, I have seen a major pushback in regards to AI generated images and like the sleekness of it, because we can all tell those of us who are in the industry, we can all tell that you created an image using AI, right? Um, and so I've noticed that there has been a pushback through raw, genuine, gritty, grainy content um, being pushed out that's more lived in and relatable, um, especially on websites, because it's like, Anybody, if anybody could be behind that website, right? So like the, and, and it's actually the type of imagery now that is becoming more prevalent is called phonography instead of photography. It's called phonography where it's like a person could take in that photo with their phone. And that gives a, like a feeling of that no like and trust factor because we know it's an actual person. So there are two camps to this, right? It's like, there's one camp where it's like, we see that AI is creating amazing images and it can pass as an image. But then there's this other camp where it's like, people don't even want to use those type of images and want like real relatable, like content that is created via a phone, because we all know that it's like not fake and created by AI. So I just thought that was really interesting. Have you seen like the difference between images, like let's say there's like a super sleek looking one, but then there's one that kind of looks lived in and grainy. Do you feel like that, like those two, because you can create both with AI, right? Like you can create a sleek looking image in AI, like let's say like Dolly, Dolly has a problem with realism. Um, but then let's say if you create one over at mid journey that looks hella real, like in grainy and it looks like phonography, like have you seen um, a difference in data in regards to that on your website? So I wasn't sure. Oh, great question, Heather. You're right about the idea of someone seeing a, a, uh, a page with AI and then they, they run away. They're like, oh, this is AI image. I, I don't think they're genuine. I don't think they're unique. I don't think they're authentic. I just feel like they just copied and pasted some random AI prompt from somewhere. Now, for me, what I've noticed with this AI tool, it's the exact opposite. As far as my podcast, because you know it's testing, right? If you test a thumbnail on a blog and it works, you can test the same you know, thumbnail on an email. You can test the same one on a YouTube thumbnail. You can test it on a podcast cover art. So I was doing that consistently to the point where I said, hold up, let me, let me switch this up a little bit. Let me actually put in good prompts and the images I get actually look aesthetically pleasing. 
because there are some AI images you see that look so bootleg. They look so like pixelated. They just look boring. Like there's really nothing to show, right? But this tool has changed everything for me because I would say, hey, I'm looking for something. All right, Heather, let's actually role play because I'm actually there. Tell me something you want to see. Let's actually do it right now. Like and an I'm image? Gonna, yeah, tell me what you want to see and I'll, and I'll generate it right now. So I had this prompt that I had and I can't find it. Anyway, um, I want to see a bacon cheese, uh, a double bacon cheese burger sitting on a wooden table with a bar behind it. I know I keep thinking about like burgers and cheeseburgers, but guys, I'm a social media manager and strategist for hospitality and restaurants. Like I can't, <laughs> <laughs> do you I can't it, not. <laughs> do you want it to be like, where do you want this double cheese? Like I know it's sitting on a wooden table with a bar behind it. Is there anything yeah. you want going on or you just want to see just that? Um, with, uh, yeah, just that. Just keep it clean and simple. Okay. So yeah. do you want I just want to see how detailed the burger is going to be, you know, because like oh, it yeah. can tell the difference between like an AI generated burger with like Dolly using chat mm -hmm. GPT. But then like, I've seen like some crazy looking photos over on mid journey. So, okay. So I'm about to, I'm, I'm actually doing it right now. So it's, it's I prompted it. I said double bacon cheeseburger sitting on a wooden table with a bar behind it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as we wait for it to load, I want to, it's, yeah, it's generating right now. Uh, and what, what app is this? The it's called I, ideogram. I just put it in the chat. Yeah. Ideo, ideogram the AI. Oh, wow. Oh my goodness. You know, wait a minute. You know, Heather, if what? I, hmm, you know, I, let me uh, <laughs> you can't think <laughs> i yeah i'm gonna do something i'm thinking out loud i'm gonna put <laughs> yes i'm gonna put this picture in fact i'm gonna airdrop it to my phone right now i'm going and i got four images i got i even got some chips i got some fries i got some bacon oh, yeah, yeah so crazy. i'm going to download this image in ptr what will i go and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use like LinkedIn or threads and I'm going to ask guys, guys, is this photo real or is it fake? Dude, <laughs> like, I'm so excited yeah. that you showed this to me because like I've been looking for an AI generator that will actually generate some like, because I'm sorry, but mid journey, the, the level of entry or like the barrier of entry to mid journey is really difficult for me. I don't know okay. why, but like, I don't, I don't understand what is it co-off of not slack what is it twitch or something i don't know whatever then i gotta log in and uh, yeah just... this you know all you guys you gotta do here is just log in it's free yeah i signed in right now I'm yeah it. it's yeah. such a cool thing like it's i've never used mid journey i kind of saw it from afar when i saw you have to go into uh discord and do yeah discord prompt, i can't I said, do that it's i said so i'm not doing it. that that this should not be the future. Like not everyone's going in the, not 8 billion people in the world are going to be on discord. Exactly. So we need something that's more realistic. And I was cool. I mean, I'm patient. I'll take my time and, you know, we'll see where this goes. All right, guys, read PTR. Da, 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 Stop. Da, 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 No way, bro. Hold on. Is that, is that a real photo? Can you message that to me on IG, please, too? Because I want to be able to expand it, like, even, like, really expand it. All right. I'm sending it to you My right now. My God, stop. That's a lot of bacon. It's a lot of bacon. I didn't even tell them how many bacon. They <laughs> that's said, even right, making we got me you. very hungry. I can't lie, Faber. That's making me very, <laughs> very hungry. I can't. <laughs> there you go. I just sent it to you, Heather. David, I'm going to text it to you. Thank you. Um, and then Leopold's finest. I'm an Instagram. I don't have your number, so I'm gonna send it to you on Instagram. Heather, you see it? I gotta get my other phone. Hold on. David, I just texted it to you. Um, then, and then Leopold's finest. I've just sent it to you too. Awesome. Hey, favor, can I jump in here real quick? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I know a thing or two of photography, so I'm just going <laughs> to say a few, few words. Um, so 
back to uh, what 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 uh, Heather was saying earlier about photos uh, being grainy and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I have seen that in AI, um, and I I've been a photographer for many years and stuff like that, and uh, I have seen these AI programs like come up and they're just man they're nailing it everything from lighting to i mean it's it's hard to tell and i think we're already there where these ai um, generators are making it just like a photographer would have taken it you know uh as far as uh phonographers i mean that's been around for about man i guess since the invention of phones right but uh they, it's just um it, it you know and and you can tell i think when you know as the phones were, you know, getting better and stuff like that with the pixel rate and all that, um, you, you can tell where there was a phone, a uh, picture taken with a phone and a, and a picture taken with a DSLR right off the top, right? Especially somebody that has been a photographer and, and knows about all that kind of stuff. But um, I just want to say like this right here, which is just dropped here, um, favor, this is just amazing for blog posts because there is things like I have a huge library of photography that I've taken and and I think that it, even Google appreciates it that, that that it's a real photograph and it's it was taken by a creator and stuff like that but um and I'm not saying anything against uh AI generated images in fact what you just sent over I could see so many possibilities with creating more blog posts that will help me with even illustrations you know, like the one that I'm seeing here, like uh, design style. I mean, this is so cool. I mean, I can't even pull this off with my camera. So there's things with AI will give you that pushover. And like you said, people will sit on your on your blog a little bit more and it makes it more interesting, you know, having this uh, images that also translate the message that you're trying to say, whether it's a poster or like I said, illustrating, um, I think it's awesome, man. I, I, I'm just looking at this website and it's like, wow, this is amazing. I have, I work with another J, uh, AI, it's called Leonardo AI, and it's pretty good. Uh, but I don't think it has like illustrations and posters and other things that you can create here. So I really enjoying this. And then the fact that you can also tweak up the colors, the color palettes and stuff like that. I mean, golly, this is um, ongoing. <laughs> but anyways, I just want to drop that and Back to you, Faber. Love it. Love it already. Thank you so much, David. And welcome, Ryan and Miss Andrea. Loving the outfit, by the way. I got to tell you that. Happy Friday. <laughs> I'm getting a call in the middle. And also, your ticket. You still got your ticket on you. We got to get that off you so that you can be a member here. Miss Andrea, welcome to the room. Hi. Good afternoon from London. And um, I ignore the call for, for this room. It's all right. <laughs> I'm on stage. And yes, I need to join the club. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Ryan, we'd love to hear from you. Welcome. How are you doing, Favor? I'm doing what you guys are talking about. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, this is this is a great topic. I wanna ask, I wanna ask you, because I know some people just came in the room. Let me start off with you, Miss Andrea. Do you think someone took this photo or do you think AI took this photo on my profile my ptr let me analyze okay and uh nude sister girl fran hey tina welcome to room good morning guys put in the chat let me know just tell me if you were here if you just joined if you just came in let me know if it was real if it's some if i took that picture somebody took that picture or an ai took that picture Tina, welcome. Good morning. The bacon looks a bit too perfect. However, it can, it still looks like someone's taken the picture. But the bacon is, that's not what bacon looks like. Well, I don't know. I don't know how bacon looks like in other restaurants, but the way advertisement is, um, restaurants, they do, it looks too perfect. And when you actually go to the restaurant, it's not how the picture is. So I'm not too sure really, but it looks like a human being has taken that picture. Hmm. Okay. Tina says it looks like AI. 
So I'm going to say, and I actually saw a video about Gary V the other day say this. So um, he was talking to a food creator who c works with chefs and restaurants. And the guy was like, you know, they don't let us use any AI except for, you know, the food. And so we just are curious, like, do you think that's false advertising? And then Gary V was like, have you ever seen a Whopper look like a Whopper? Have you seen the Whopper look like the Whopper on TV that you get in the bag? Absolutely not. Food styling has been a thing forever. Like for mayonnaise and food styling, they use glue. So like, it's not even real what we're looking at in regards to food anyway. Um, but yeah, I do agree that bacon definitely looks too perfect. Yikes. That's, that's, Go ahead, that's funny you say that, Heather. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> because I've done some <clears throat> food prepping and stuff like that to take the actual pictures. But yeah, we used all kinds of stuff. I mean, by the time we were done with that piece of whatever it was, a cake or a burger or a slice of pizza or tacos or whatever, I was just disgusted. I, I didn't want to even, you know, not even touch it because we had done so much and uh to it to make it look fresh to make it look like the real deal right and it's whatever it's in front of the camera on that image that that's important right so uh on that that angle and that frame so yeah we would do everything possible i mean to make it look the most refreshing more best enticing uh, uh, meal that you could ever have. But yeah, it's funny. It just takes me back. What you just said takes me back to those days where we used to uh, prep also uh, food for, for restaurants and stuff like that. So <laughs> thank you for that. So true. Like you think about it, even like body soap, <laughs> lotion, uh, like think about all the things, oil, like just all the things you see on commercials. It's like hyper animated and people you know they see it because it's it's presentation right when you get something on if you get a a bowl of rice on your plate somebody gives you rice in a form of a uh like a bowl like a nice shape of a bowl like it looks like a dome and then somebody else just flat line gives you just rice on on the plate you know you're definitely going to get the one that has that you can actually cut the rice in half you can you know take a few pieces you know add some stew on it it feels good because that's an experience right it's the same rice <laughs> but it's a different same price too but it's a different experience you know so i, I think it's also based on the the perception and how you also brand it too. When I look at these big brands, you know, Rolex, when you look at all these like luxury brands, when you look at them doing bags, watches, if you notice the reason why that they're so luxurious is not just because of the bag or because of the, the, the jewelry or the shiny object that you see, it's because the camera, the lens zooms right into the actual subject. And that actual subject, if it's a watch, you're gonna see the detail of the watch right down to the battery. You can see the battery from the from the clip because you wanna see exactly every single thing that's happening. So when they zoom in, they give you all those close-ups, that's because they want to make sure you, you feel like, ah, I wanna get close to this thing. When you're seeing people you know, with food, you're seeing the food right in front of you, it's because it's like, hey, I want this up and close because I want to actually eat the burger. I wanna have the fries, you know, I wanna have the bacon. So when you think about your brand and you're taking pictures of your products, take products, and David is a per perfect person to tell you about that, you know, with product photography. When you look at the close-ups, when you look at how those things are taken, you know, it's, it has a perception on you, right? It, it shows some type of style. If I take the same picture ultra wide, standard, and then zoomed all the way in, they're going to be different expressions, right? Because your eyes are seeing things in different ways. So what you're focusing on entirely with your eye is what's going to reply back to your mindset to tell you something that you should respond to, whether it's a call to action or buy now or save later or something like that. Go ahead, Heather. I messaged you a picture that I just generated over on Instagram. This thing is bonkers. I only found one little mistake in it and... Also, my image is hilarious. So if you want to put it in your PTR and ask people, because I think it, it's, dude, it's pretty good. I will. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Heather. I... <laughs> it's so good. Text it or send it. 
put it on the I'm 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 gonna okay. text it right now to you. Let me repeat here for everyone. And then um even with the candles, they look so real. I'm like, what am I looking at here? But Heather, did you write those words? I did. So oh what my I God. <laughs> So what I did was I was like, okay, well, I'm turning 40 and I'm having a 40th birthday party. <laughs> I'm having a 40th birthday party in April and it's also my 15 year anniversary for my business. So I'm kind of creating like a party for all of it. And I was like, I want one of these cakes. And so I asked ChatGPT what to write on the cake. And then I put it into the um, ideagram.ai and that's what I got. That's wild. <laughs> that is wild. No, no, this, Isn't is, that funny? this is really good. That is so, so good, Heather. Now, I, I just love that you were able to try it out and see it because a lot of people are going to test this thing out and they'll be surprised. And then put it on your website, put it in your email list, see what happens. Do you like it's so interesting to see the value that you give people just by just putting these things. And I love that you can actually even change the aspect ratio. You can do one by one, 16 by nine, nine by 16. You can choose your aspect ratio. And then I use a website called coolers.co. Coolers.co, it allows me to get like the right palettes for colors, especially when we build websites for clients. We want to know what your colors are, your themes, your palettes. And then if you write, have the right palette, you just come to this ideogram, give, the, give them your brand palette, and then all the AI images you have there will have your logo, it would have your brand, your theme, your font, your style, like you're using this to actually build. So this was a really good one. I'm going to do one more prompt. I and I will say this is actually $16 a month, which is not bad. To how be much honest. is mid-journey? 16 times two, 16 times 12 is 192 a year. I think they even have something that's like, it's, it's, hold on, let me upgrade my plan and see what happens. Oh, there's a basic for $7 a month. That's 12% off. But then the okay. plus one is 20% off at $16 a month. But I mean, like, come on, that's like, you could write that off if you use it in your business. Like this is so good that I'm so th thank you favor. Cause I've been looking for an AI generator that actually looks like actual images without having to deal with the bullshit of mid journey. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. This is what we love to do. Help people, businesses, creatives save money. That's what we do. We want to help you save money. Cause when you don't know, you don't know. And sometimes when we just keep going around in circles, we don't know what we're going to find. So I wanted to make sure that today, Friday, you know, I've been doing this all week and I said, why not do this and, you know, give back so that you guys can have this. When I send out emails too, I put it there in the little subscript, like at the very bottom foot of the email. I'm like, by the way, I use Ideogram AI to generate this image and I'll tell them what the prompt is. I actually give them the prompt because you want people to try it out for themselves, see if they get the same thing or get a different thing. Because people will now start asking, oh, if I put the same, if me and you put the same prompt, will we get the same result? I don't know, You find we can find out. But I think it will be different because it's also studying how you 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 write it's studying how you you prompt it's studying how you you ask for things so if we can say the same thing cheeseburger cheeseburger you might get an, an anime version i might get a 3d version because we just have different interests and then it's like instagram and unsplash together because not don't just look at your images look at the other images people have put out there because you can either do public or private so if you do public, any image you generate publicly will be seen in the public domain. And look at all those amazing images people have used, right? Like animes, cartoons, um, quotes, put them on Pinterest, put them on your threads. Like the list is endless. If the list is endless. There's a thread I did yesterday. I did a repost. It's about to hit 100,000 views. By the end of today, it's going to hit 100,000 views. It's crazy. And all I did was say, <laughs> this page makes me happy. That's all I said. And now I have over 150 followers on threads. It's gone up, it's still going up. I'm getting new followers. People are connected with me. Now I'm, I think somebody wants to be on a podcast um, round table panel with six or seven people. I'm gonna be talking. So it's just opening up crazy doors <laughs> just because wow. everyone repos. Yes, Heather, go ahead. So somebody asked in the, Thing. Don't the AI generated images have tags that Google indexes or ranks lower for SEO? Or if an article still has human like content and helpful, then it outweighs AI tags? 
great question. I didn't see that. That's a big question. That was Austin. from Austin. Okay. Now, this is what I would say. And it goes back to the basics. Back to the basics. When you download this image from Ideogram or from any AI software, right? What is going to separate you from the generic person just using AI images is SEO. And what I mean by that is how do you specify your content for the right people that are looking for your blog, for your article, for your newsletter, for your podcast. Now, because of the helpful content that, you know, has been created by Google and because you have tags, when, you know, let me just give an analogy, right? You know, when you, let's say person A and person B use the same song, person A doesn't say, I don't own the rights to this copy or to this song. Person B says, I don't own the rights to this copy or to this song. One of them is going to end up having their account removed or the post removed because they are going through copyright infringement, right? Because they're using a song that they didn't, you know, have a disclaimer on. So when you do the same thing with your AI images, right? When you download the AI image, any image you download, even the one I downloaded, the burger one, right? That AI image, when you download it, I'm actually going to look at it right now. Oh, I can't even see what it was because I had to rename it. That's just me. <laughs> I naturally just rename because I don't want to see X, Y, F, A, you know, Z, X, B, B, Y dot JPEG. I don't like to see that on my screen. So I naturally just rename my files. So I renamed this before I even put it here on Clubhouse. And before I even send it to you, Heather, or David or Liverpool's Finest, I said double dash bacon dash cheeseburger. So I actually renamed it. So when you download the file, the file is going to give you something generic. So when you rename the file, what you're doing is that you're creating a library. You know, when you have a library, you put bookmarks, you put highlighters, you put stickers, you put flashcards. When you start using and writing on those materials, it now customizes a material for the brand, right? If we say all books with A on this aisle, all books with C on this aisle, that's because there's a sticker that says this way or that way. So when you rename the file that you have the image, the AI image, right? When you rename that file, you're putting the keyword there. Then when you upload the, the file, you're adding the alt text there. And then on top of that, you're putting a caption that is contextually linked. You can now hyperlink that image to the content that you're referring to. So when you do that, when you make those critical tactical moves, instead of just uploading, downloading the image, uploading it, and then posting, as opposed to taking your time to really understand why am I using this picture? And then on top of that, letting people know, hey, this is an AI generated image, right? When you put those text explicitly within your copy, or even if you're saying it like on a podcast or you're putting it out there, then semantically you're allowing the algorithm to understand that yes, it's AI and Google can also index it because it's operating under file extension. An AI image and a photorealistic image and an image taken from a DSLR and an image taken from an iPhone, they'll all have the same file format. It might be different. One might be raw. One might be, you know, HEIC. Um, one might be JPEG. One might be WebP. One might be SVG. You know, all these file formats sound all over the place but they're all photos they're all photo file formats so when the photo file format is optimized for seo with keywords then you can index those pages with the keywords that you've added within those images to now help you rank higher because google is indexing you based on quality so if you have an ai image and you don't have supporting text then it's not going to give you the full capacity of that AI image. But if I use this AI image and it looks like a burger and then I give you a whole recipe, I add a YouTube video, I put a, uh, some statistics, I put some stuff on top of it, that AI image is the least of my worries because somebody's seeing that it looks great. And now on top of that, there's context for me to actually understand how to even make this burger I'm looking at. So when you do it that way, as opposed to just upload, download, copy, paste, and, and publish, 
then that changes everything and also outweighs your competition. Heather, do you want to add on to that too? Oh, no, I love that so much. Um, I mean, <laughs> so this photo that I actually sent to you is a photo of my computer screen. So would that be generated AI or would that be <laughs> or would that be a photo of a cake through a computer screen? I don't know. Um, but yeah, just making sure that you optimize everything. You can even go in the back end of the image itself on like jask paint shop pro or adobe and actually like change the information on the back end of the image and then even resave it as like a different file type so i mean as long as you're doing the seo things to i don't know optimize the ai image but then you come into like i'm sorry but like i'm a, I'm a morality girly i i have to tell the truth so like if there is an image generated i don't know i feel like that we do need to label it a i mean there's instagram that is asking us to label if it is an ai generated image um you know somebody actually right on linkedin was like just did a poll about their copy being uh, flagged as AI generated. So I think we do need to be careful and just, yes, use AI as a tool, use AI generated images as a tool, but put that human element and that graphic design element maybe over top of it. And then it's like, okay, it finally has that, that manual human element that the platforms are looking for. And then I think you should be covered. Exactly. You know, I appreciate that because it's so it's so big when you look at these images, some images you look at, you're like, damn, this is so real, but yet it's so fake <laughs> and it's still real, too. And iOS 18, this is just the beginning of it, y'all, especially when Apple intelligence starts to fly and you start getting emojis that look different from what you're used to seeing. It's, it's going to be a whole wild scene out here. So it's great it actually shows our imagination our creativity as a brand how do you show up what color palettes do you use so it really gives you that you know long-standing response so austin that was a great question that you asked there thank you so much for that tina are you available she might be busy let us know when you hey, go ahead good, good morning how are I'm you i'm good i'm good we'd love to hear your thoughts on the topic I'm sort of just tapping in and out. I just, um, so I haven't caught the whole question, but I was paying attention to some of the aspects of AI and making sure that your content is aligned with your brand. That's what I'm doing with my um, teams as well as my classes, that AI should be a supportive tool. I'm at the point, right? Otherwise, you're going to detract from what you bring to the table in your human intelligence or your organic intelligence. It's going to be detractor and an enhancer. So it should only be a supportive tool. I love that. Yes, that tool piece has to be enhanced with what you're with what you're creating. Welcome, Mimi. You know, you have to be very, very specific on how you show up and who you're showing up for because even the way you show up and connect you can start to build even animation characters and then turn them into actual video characters you know because you're using those prompts and you're creating those experiences so the idea of creating content is such a, a amazing thing uh one thing i'm planning to do I don't know who's going to benefit from this, but I'm still thinking, you know, you have so many ideas and you think you're like, who's going to do this? I had this whole ABC thing going on where I wanted to create, and I have a copy, but I'm still thinking about if I should do it to have like a, an SEO coloring book. So, you know, I have an, this AI image that was generated and then it turns into like a coloring book. So you can actually print it out in color in between the lines, but you're coloring concepts so it's something that, that went crazy in my mind one time and i was like yeah this would be a good idea because you people can also get to know imagine like drawing an ai image or coloring an ai you know image because it, it has that feel it has that look and it looks real too so when you're creating content and you're giving people these things it also shows you know where your business stands I'm, i won't even be surprised if people start using welcome Saturday. If people start using AI to create logos, I'm sure it's already happening, you know, having a logo as an AI generated image, and then people get to know that that's the actual copy. I've, I've done it. You see what I'm saying? Saturday, I think has done it too. Yeah. So 
it's a real thing, right? And then you're going to register that thing. You're going to put a next code on that thing. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to trademark it. You're going to, it's a whole AI logo, but it's real because it's happening. You have a whole stamp, like you've printed it out. There's a sign post. Now you got a lighthouse in front of your office. Like it's something that can really happen and it's true. So when you look at these platforms and you now translate everything we've talked about with AI images, and then you translate that into your blog, that's where the real source comes from. Because when people are reading your blog, they're not just, okay, <laughs> Saturdays, I haven't done anything. Hi, no problem. Appreciate that. When you create content and you have AI images like these, these images are going to accelerate your traffic. If you do what I was saying earlier and what Heather was saying too on just positioning your content, it helps. My podcast cover arts these days are AI generated. <laughs> if you click this link above and you see it, it's AI generated, right? And if you look at the images specifically, it's, it's a, let me just share my, I was about to say share my screen, share this link with you this is the same we did this room sometime back this week right look at this image look at the cover it says seo for local businesses that was an ai image right and that's driving downloads i can look at my i'm like oh that's downloads okay people like this people like blue green yellow pink like i get to even know what colors you like in the process while i'm also showing you concepts so we're using psychology marketing beyond just seo and beyond just keywords it's it's people we're talking to it's lives we're changing here so if we are writing content for seo and our page structure is strong we have a title we have a subtitle we have a sub subtitle right we have a concept then we're dividing our text we're having line breaks in between our text we're using emojis we're using quotes we're using embedded photos, embedded videos from YouTube shorts, not shorts, from YouTube, actual YouTube, from Spotify, from Apple, from, you know, anywhere that you want to embed, TikTok, Instagram, you can embed those pictures, bring them to your website, right? Because you're essentially creating content for people so that they can also learn more about you. And then the good thing about these strategies is that when you have something like this, it's in something called an open graph, right? And an open graph is what you see on social media. If I send you a link and say, hey, here's my link, um, follow me on social media, or here's a, you know, a, a link like this one up here, that open graph is a section, they call it OG, right? Open graph, because in there you want to put content that actually will give you a metric that are, that attributes to the brand, the keyword, the phrase, and the message that you're trying to convey. So when you start putting emojis, like you see how I have emojis with the search, with a the building, there's an actual building in the image, like these are all calculated. It's not just, oh, paste this image here, or paste this. People that, you know, do podcasts, they don't use emojis. I don't know why. But emojis make your, your, it makes you stand out because there are so many words to read, but there are not so many emojis to see. So now you're working with an unsaturated filtered audience that allows you to connect with people at a faster scale, that allows you to get higher click rates, higher open rates, right? Because when you send an email with an emoji in the subject line, that's an open rate that's gonna be higher than just text only. So when you start using these tactics to increase people to connect with you, it helps. As a blogger, as a writer, as a creative, when you write content, try use odd numbers, right? Try create an article with a question mark, right? And see what happens to your articles because you have to see the goal that it takes and how the route that it takes depends on how you actually build it from scratch. So using these images is not just for you to rank, but it's also for you to relate. And if you can relate, it's a great thing. Use about three images. One to three images are good. If you go over that, still fine. But you want to make sure that you can use as much images as you can to convey the message that if somebody just scans through your article, 
they can understand what you're saying or what you're trying to say without them having to spend three minutes understanding the concept. So if you can give people quick, easy, understandable words that they can actually digest and then come back tomorrow for more, then you're always going to be in that repeat cycle. I even tried something, some really great hack on for, uh, for podcasters and try this out. And I'd love to hear thoughts on this, Heather, too. Let's say today's Friday and I tried this out last week. It worked. I tried it out again this week. I'm like, okay, this is something I'm going to be doing. <laughs> it's such a crazy concept, but it's, it's I don't know. It's kind of like depending on your audience, though. I mean, I like to do things in real time and also I like to do things over time because it's, it lasts a long time to, together, too. So let's say you've been working hard, you've been building all week, right? And then on Friday, you drop all the episodes that you've done and you backdate your episodes and then you give it another week. And now you're right into the weekend and you send an email. That's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to send an email to our list. We'll tell them, hey, guys, you know, we have new episodes out there. And then they binge all weekend, right? Into the new week. Now, instead of uploading an episode on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, and on Friday, you publish all of them on Friday, but you backdate them. And then you now scale them through with an email. When you do that, it surges the algorithm because you've uploaded at a rapid pace. It's like uploading blogs, you know, and backdating them. You can do that. And you're not just backdating because you want to backdate, but you're actually backdating because that was the date you actually did it on. And when you do that, people will not really know, but if you're actually, if they're hearing your content, if they're reading and it was happening on that day, then it will make sense because contextually you actually relevant to the topic. So have you thought about that, Heather, or tried it? I have not tried that because I don't really batch my <laughs> my podcasts um yeah we do ours live so and people want it before the next episode so yeah i don't do that but it's a really smart idea though yeah for me with podcasting is all about testing like i can publish away today you know even publishing at midnight is also a great time to publish you know your podcast so Every, I mean, try it out. There are no rules, <laughs> absolutely no rules. Mine might not work for you. Yours might not work for me, but what works for you will work for you. And what works for me works for me. But if we try working things out and then they don't work out, we can try something else and then it gets better over time. So that that's a really good one. Tina, <laughs> thank you so much for that um, with SEO. I try to make SEO easy to understand because people hear it and they just cringe away. So I'm happy that you're able to do that. Thank you. I was just thinking about the fact that I have so much content. I've been on air since 2010, right? And I was like, can I put these in blog format and backdate this? Would that be relevant? I mean, it's hundreds of episodes of content um, that I'm moving from, you know, legacy media into my own space. So thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that because I literally just had that question and I literally was just playing with mid journey. I was so bored with the whole discord thing and everything else. So thank you for the other tool too. So I came right on time. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. I'm glad I was able to help you out with that. Cause I'm, I'm just tired of people trying out things and it's not working. And when it's working for someone, you should tell the whole world, like, you know, to the mountaintop. So I said, hey, since I've been doing this SEO for series all week, I wanted to, you know, top it off with this. You know, I started off with brands on Monday, then I did local businesses, and then I did podcasters, and then I did, what else did I do? Social media yesterday, and then today is, you know, bloggers. And... Each and every one of them, welcome Cuckoo, each and every one of them, you know, have their own thing to bring. Because when you listen to all these episodes and you really want to understand how to do them, don't just listen. Because listening attributes to 5% of acquisition, of learning, right? 5% of learning acquisition comes from listening. So right now you're listening and that's contributing to 5%. The other 95%, you're doing something totally different from what you're doing right now. Now, when it hits 90% of learning acquisition, it means you're able to teach another person 
the same concept because you have 100% close to undivided attention and that other 5% could be wandering into something, but it's not as detrimental as the opposite, right? So when you, as opposed to, of course, 595, as opposed to 9010. So that 10% is just for improvement, right? Because we're not perfect. So the more you're able to improve on your marketing, improve on your targeting, the better it is. Like, I know where my audience is. I know who they are. We've been doing this for five years. We have over 400 episodes. I know what's what they want to hear more of. I want to know what they want to hear less of. They don't have to tell me. I can just read it through the data points. And because we're sending emails and we have, you know, a, a website that has SEO treatment on, I'm able to know those keywords that they're looking for. So I'm able to know these are the topics that people want to hear more of. And if they want to hear more of these topics, who can talk about this extensively or should we bring the same person that we interviewed back to talk about it a little bit more? So you're able to give more color to your show because you're easily connecting the dots together. So when you now use a blog and you're writing as a blogger, you're writing SEO for copy so that when people can see the copy, they can understand the copy. Imagine you receiving copy and you can't understand that document. You can't grade it, you can't read it, you can't paraphrase it, you can't do nothing because it's not, it, it's, it just doesn't work. But what works is that you say something, it's translated, a five-year-old can understand it, and you're able to at least translate that across different mediums. So what to do to make writing work is use this website, I've talked about it before, called capitalizemytitle.com. And then you can find their tools and they have a free headline analyzer. When you look out for these three things in your title, look out for the sentimental value, look out for the semantic value, and look out for the SEO value, right? Does this topic make me happy? Is it concise? Do I understand it? Is it readable? And if it is, then how can I break this concept down into different pieces? Then when you do that, that's when you know that there's a lot of things coming your way. So you have to think about blogging as a piece to the puzzle, right? Why do I say this? Especially for podcasters, for bloggers, for authors, for writers, for creators. Even Alex Hormozzi said this, for you to be successful, <laughs> you just got to do more. Gary Vee said it too. You got to do more, 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 more. The, the revenge to success is more. To, to failure is more. If you want to let, let someone know, hey, I can actually do this, you got to do more. If I'm going to do more push-ups or more sit-ups, that's because I'm doing more. If I'm doing more reps, it's because I'm doing more. If I'm doing more episodes, it's because I'm doing more. If I'm creating more blogs, it's because I'm doing more. You know what happens when you do more? You have more to work with. You have more to work with. Like you were saying, Tina, with backdating, you can backdate it. Because when you backdate it, within the technical algorithm setup, right, we can only see the front. Because I talked about it earlier in the room, HTML and XML, right? And then there's RSS for podcasts. HTML is hypertext markup language. XML is expandable markup language. So your XML is proportional to your RSS. And RSS stands for really simple syndication, right? And some people also call it rich some rich something something right but it's it's highly based on rich text right and it's for syndicational purposes meaning that you're creating content within a sequence right what is your sequence of your podcast is it bi-weekly is it semi-weekly is it annually is it monthly is it daily is it like what is it then you can define that within the structure of your business so when you're creating content and then you backdate it within the xml file the XML file will tell you when it was last modified. You know, when you look at your, your computer, right? And you go to a folder, it will tell you the name of the folder. It will tell you when it was last modified, when it was last added or something like that. It will tell you the file type. If you open the folder, it will tell you this is a PDF, this is a waveform, this is an audio, this is, you know, an image. It will tell you everything, right? Because it's, it's clear in image, it's clear sample, it's clear communication, right? Now, when you upload that audio, when you upload your 
episode cover art when you upload your video before you hit upload look at your local drive before you send it to the server and make sure that you have renamed the file so that it's keyworded to match the search because when people are searching online they're searching from a database so if the database has the wrong information or you're in the wrong aisle in the library your podcast starts with a b but you're in line aisle f <laughs> you're not going to be seen by the right people yesterday i was talking about uh you know when you think about even your podcast what category do you have to choose because in each category for podcasts there are different percentages there are different podcast titles i mean um podcast totals and then there are also podcast percentages so in each category there's a different percentage that it attributes to you so if you're top x percent it's because you're top in that category of that percentage if that makes sense so when you're top of something it means that you're you're in the industry. When you look at the Forbes list, you know, the billionaires, they are all billionaires, millionaires, because they are the top at something in their industry, tech, you know, whatever else it is, you know, real estate, you know, whatever it is, you know, those are different elements. Yes, they're all on the list, but they all do different things. So the same thing with your podcast, with your YouTube, with your blog. If you're at the top of the search, it means that you have created a root like a root directory from the base. If you have 100 episodes, it means 100 episodes have the word SEO in each of the audio files that you upload. If you do leadership, if you do social media, the words should be within those context pieces because when you upload those files, that's great. Let's say you want to do this all over again and you probably messed up or you didn't know that this is what you were supposed to do. Thank God for podcasts. You can go back to your podcast, replace the audio file, with the same audio file, but rename the audio file so that you can get the right index. So that when you now look at your XML file, it will say last updated August 30th. Let's say you did an episode, Tina, in, in let's say May 30th, for example, 2024, and you backdate it, you're gonna backdate it to that time so that when somebody clicks on that image or clicks on that page, it takes them exactly to that time. Even though it's in real time, that time will still be time stamped. And that allows someone to understand where or what you were saying at that time. And then when you create another article to support the last one, or you update the new one, or you update the one that had already been published, then it gives you more context. It's like credit. You know, I think about it like domains are like credit. So if you have a large, if you have a large credit history for 10 years, 20 years, you have more equity than somebody who just signed up for a credit card two days ago, right? Because they, of that credit history. So when you look at those things sequentially, it pays a lot of sense into what you're creating. I wanted to pass that to you, Tina. That was super valuable because I was really um, overwhelmed by all the stuff that I want to put out right now in this format. Um, and I was literally wondering also, I put it in the chat, if I should strip all the audio from my video and put just the audio in the podcast format, and if that would be valuable. So we're navigating a, a chunky system here to consolidate it. And so you've been answering a lot of the questions, especially as you were talking about the XML to RSS feed versus the HTML and where it stands right now so that I can sort of look at it from that perspective. And then the root directories, right? I think having the naming convention pretty congruent since 2011 um, is going to make it valuable, but I still been been wondering, should I just remove it and then move it? and put it into this new world, because some of it's on YouTube, some of it's on other platforms, some of it on other people's platforms. And I was looking at it as this is legacy content. In other words, there's conversations that are happening right now that I have time date stamp of me saying the exact thing in 2012. So I sort of wanted to keep the timeline date and reference that and then do an updated, um, soundbite with the same um tags same seo for all my i content. love that yeah thank you for that tina it's it's very possible to do that 
especially if you're doing it on your property, because there are some platforms that may not, you know, do that. Some platforms may say, okay, 2012, that's really, really way back. And then you have to keep on going back, back, back. But it's possible because when you schedule an episode, I'm actually doing it in real time as I'm speaking to you on my hosting platform. Yeah, I'm going all the way back to 2021. Yeah, it's taking me all the way back, 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 back. So if I want to do this and then say, okay, let's get all your episodes from here to here, you show up in 2024 with 100 episodes from 2012 or 500 episodes from 2012, then someone will be like, wait a minute. They can't, first of all, they won't, they won't question it because it happened at that time. It would it would be completely different if I have an episode today and then I go back to 2012, 2012 to now say, oh, I had this episode in 2012 and yet it's 2024. That would be, that's just not right. That's just lack of integrity. But, okay, so if it's yeah. on YouTube, I'm sorry, because that's really literally what we're walking through today. I have my staff here. Um, I have, vid like I said, the videos are time marked on those dates in history, right? When I said certain things. And I felt like it was more important for people to be able to point to the fact that that date is there. So instead of just reposting it, the blog is new, right? Because I'm refreshing the conversation and tying it today. But I was going to leave the YouTube video link as 2012. And then I thought about the backdating um, of not just have the video link, but embed the YouTube video onto a separate page, backlink that, and then put it into today's blog. If that you makes could, any sense. <laughs> yeah, you could do that too, because it's more of an updated version and it's still okay because Google loves fresh content. So even if you said it years ago, you can add one or two statements, add one or two statistics, add one or two keyframes or questions or case studies that are currently happening in recent times. And that way it also validates what you said before as an expert, because that information is still evergreen. It's just that it's another time, maybe another formula, maybe another process, but the fundamentals still remain the same. So if you're trying to get your videos on Spotify or Apple or iHeart or, or any of these platforms, one thing I would say is I don't know how other platforms work, but I like to do research on them if I need to go there. But for you, if you want to get your episodes as videos to a podcast, you can still directly upload videos into your podcast hosting distribution platform. And the platforms that allow hosting with video like Spotify, you can watch the whole video there. I do that for a church um, that I used to go to and I'm still doing it for them even if I'm not there because I'm in Houston and they're in Atlanta. And every Sunday they have their recording on YouTube, the service on YouTube. I grab the whole YouTube video. I use my AI assistant to sc scrape the whole, the whole service, get all the keynotes, all the timestamps, and then I take all that information and I go into the podcast and then I submit it so that they can now go back to the sermon. They can listen. I do that for my show and also for our clients as well. So it's the same formula. It's just a different blueprint. So if we do that for you, then it makes it easier for you just to talk, you know, say your thing, go about your day, and then the rest of the post-production is done because we have a team that does that for, for us too. So we are on, on point with that post-production in check you know, SEO in check, all those things in check. It's not just the, the quality of the audio, it's the distribution and the marketing behind the audio and the video. So you don't have to rip the audio from the video to upload it as a podcast, because if you upload it on like Spotify for podcasters, it will end up on Spotify video. And then you can use those specific sections as brand partnership deals. So let's say you're exclusive on Spotify and your somebody is paying you sponsorship to be on that segment and they're only exclusively, you know, stationed on Spotify, then you also can create a playlist, you know, for your Spotify to match the brand. There's so many things we can do with that when it comes to marketing and sponsorships, but you don't have to rip anything to add anything on. You can literally keep it as is, raw, if it's edited, if it's, you know, furnished, if it's polished, and then you can now bring that into the system and people can still binge on YouTube, binge on Spotify, binge on Apple without having to go to YouTube to watch the video. 
they can go to Spotify. If they don't want to go there, they can still be on Apple and then still subscribe to your show and connect. And then most importantly, having a website for your podcast, which a lot of people don't do, is a big miss because people would leave their podcast on their hosting platforms and use the links from those hosting platforms when they don't even own those platforms that they are hosting on. So that's why I like to say, Yes, host on those platforms, get your visibility, submit your RSS feed, get out there, do your best, you know, be the best because you are the best. And then take that information and then bring them back to your site. Because if you're submitting your RSS feed to all these platforms and in your show notes, your link, the link to your website is there, that's SEO backlinking opportunity for you. But if you just submit, publish and go your day and there's nothing coming back to you, it's like you're pouring water into a faucet. It is just not, you're not going to get a bucket full of water. It's just going to get, it's just going to be a drain. So it's really good to look at those parameters to know how best to show up online. Does that help, Tina? It does. And we're redesigning my um, broadcast site now, which is tinaspeaks.com. So it's in almost the final iterations. Now we're just putting the content on. And that's exactly what I was hearing to do put the, put everything resident to my, home base. So thank you. You just answered all of my questions that I've been toiling through. Thank you. You're welcome. This is why I do these rooms here for this long on Clubhouse, on Chatter, on LinkedIn Audio, because I, I just love to help people. Because when we get on Zoom calls, those are paid strategies. Those are paid. That's paid time. And I, I want to give that this free time as a way to, you know, give back here, help you guys understand it. Because I know someone can listen to this and learn. You know, our podcast is listened to in over 113 countries. So whenever I publish, my mindset these days is like people are listening. So I need to be careful on what I'm saying. So when people are also connecting you know, they can also connect at a large scale too. So that's that's a really good point. I'm glad I was able to break that for you, Tina. And then you can have a enjoyable, you know, holiday weekend coming. So, you know, get a little stress off the shoulders, you know? <laughs> at least in that part, we're still working. We have a huge event all weekend. So in between that, we're handling the tech. Amazing. Awesome. Okay, Tina, thank you for that question. That was good. And Sack, I just followed you. I'm in Katy too. Uh, and the church that I was referring to um, is in Atlanta, but the one I'm doing for as well in, in Katy too, they're called Mercy Hall. So if you want to check them out, RCG Mercy Hall, really good church in Katy, you can check them out as well. And then the one that I was, I've been currently doing is also called Peace Assembly there in Lilburn, Georgia. So if you, you know, type in RCCG, RCCG Mercy Hall or RCCG Peace Assembly, you will find the episodes there. I just did a quick roundup for them because it's the end of the month for them. So I just wanted to capture all those details, all the notes or the sermons or the key takeaways and all those things and, you know, send them out to people. And people actually listen because I tried that technique where I batch uploaded, because of course everything is on YouTube and Facebook, but I batch uploaded their podcast within like in one day, I did like probably seven or eight, you know, from the last previous ones that really surged the, the traffic up. And now that people are attending and they're actually connecting, now I can turn that into a cycle. So why I did that is because when you start an engine, when you start a generator, you have to use force, right? So the force you're using is uploading like on steroids. And then once you hit a pinnacle that really suits the people, then you can now start giving them like the nice waves. So I've tried so many things with podcasting and it's fun because you get to look at data. You're like, okay, this is really cool. So there are different ways to go about it. Yeah. So that's the the one I'm actually going to send you the link since you asked about it because they, they talk about the power of forgiveness. That's their that's a topic they've been going through the, this month. So I'm going to put the link in the chat so that you can see it. Sack Black. Boom. There you go. So that's the link. Check them out. And then you can follow them on Apple, you know, Spotify. That's the one in Georgia. So if you want to get the one in Houston, just let me know. We're still building it up. So <clears throat> just let me know if you need that information. But it's available out there. It's just that it's in the works. So we keep doing this, right? My goal this year, you know, when January started is to, you know, set up 50 podcasts. That was my goal. That's I think that's what I, I felt like spiritually. I was like, yeah, this is where it's leading to 50 podcasts. 
25 churches, 25 businesses. And we've we've really done a good number of them right now. So when you look at different podcasts out there, I'm like, our podcast has kind of like birthed other podcast shows and other industries. And I'm a producer, I'm a drummer, um, I do, I, I make music. So we've also incorporated original music just outside myself with my team, just to make sure we have the right brand. We do the right, you know, targeting and everything. And then I come in with the music, make the right sound. And then the episode, oh my goodness, my thread just hit over a hundred thousand views. It just, I just got a, I just got a notification on threads. Yikes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about threads one day when I come back here to show you guys what really happened. So you have to use every single thing you can possibly can to get yourself out there. My like I've been growing followers on threads like 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 a like a tree. Like since yesterday, I posted one thing, <laughs> it's gone crazy. So now I'm like, okay, now I know what I just know the key on LinkedIn. I'm about to hit 10,000 followers on threads. The numbers I've hit over hundred followers in, in two days and less than a day. This is the second day and it's, it's just jumping. And it's because I'm consistently pouring into people, sharing content, letting people know, Hey, this is what you need to do. This is how it's done. It's not just, Hey, buy this, buy that. I'm not even here to sell anything, right? If you want to work, we are available. Right. We, there's a call up here. You can book a call with us for 15 minutes. We get you set up, we get you started, you get your investment and we get you, you know, get, we just get you ready to go. Right. But if you want to just learn, this is a free space, right? Because I want to teach. I love teaching. I love helping. I love answering questions. I love giving people ideas. Like today I've helped Heather save some money. <laughs> she's been using mid journey. Now she's about to use ideogram AI. People are changing the ways they're doing things. So I like to just switch the way people think so that when you now think outside the box, in fact, throw away the whole box. Now you have a whole canvas to play with, with all the walls that you can paint, because now you're creating content for people that has contextual formatting, right? So those are some things to look out for when you write a blog. Last thing I will say is this, for bloggers, Anyone that is right, if you hire anyone, even if it's not us, if you hire any marketing agency, any digital, social media, whoever, and you hire them, Austin, you just followed me. Let me follow you right back. I'm just getting notifications all day. Okay, I just followed you back. I did a poll. I did a poll on on um on my on my threads, and I said POV, <laughs> point of view poll your first drink in the morning. I gave four options, water, tea, coffee, and juice. So far, I, I did this about three hours ago and there are 10 votes right now. So it's it's still going and it's a 24 hour vote. <laughs> so yeah, vote, tell me what you guys drink in the morning. I'm gonna come to you guys about this, but I wanna say this thing real quick before I lose it. <laughs> for bloggers, for writers, creators, whoever you are, whether you're hiring, or you're the one doing it, or you're the one supervising, or you're the one delegating, please, for this is for your sake. This is for your audience. This is for your benefit, right? Please, and welcome Julie, welcome to the room. Please guys, make sure that the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator, of your website, your domain matches the search intent of the content that you are producing for the community. Why is this so important? It's because when Google, Microsoft, even you, there's a website called you.com. It's powered by Microsoft. It's an AI search engine. So if you're on Bing, you'll also be on you. It's not YouTube, it's you, you.com. That's an AI search engine that you can actually search for content like Google. When you show up on these traditional and artificial intelligent websites, web pages, what is going to make your content stand out from the crowd, right, is the exact formula, right, of making sure that your domain has 
these three things inside. I've said it already before and I'm saying it again, but with some more context. It needs to have the right semantics, meaning the right keywords, because there's something called LSI keywords, right? Latent semantic index keywords, right? The semantics are the words that you say, the phrasing. That's why it's good to do research and development, R&D, keyword research before you even show up online because you want to know who you're talking to. You don't want to talk to everyone. You want to talk to somebody, right? And then one person you're talking to has to also know that you're talking to them. So that is like a two-way street that you have to bridge, right? So when you're creating content, and let's say I'm talking about social media strategies for entrepreneurs, social media strategies for real estate developers, social media strategies for restaurants, social media strategies for lawyers, right? All these topics I've talked about in the URL, I should be seeing social-media-restaurants. The next link, social-media-lawyers. Next link, social dash media dash fill in the blank right when you have the semantics social media there anybody that wants to learn about social media because you have a plethora of social media links right not your not your instagram links your linkedin links your website links your domain links the, you purchase that domain you purchase that website you purchase that hosting you purchase that server and now you have something to show right? Now you have a frame, a face front, right? Those links need to be interlinked together. So if I'm coming in as a lawyer and I want to learn about social media, and then I read the article and then I see their related articles, you know, uh, social media for dentists, social media for real estate, social media for that, because of my curiosity, I would technically click there because I, I want to learn social media. So I might, I might learn one or two things from another industry, right? Because maybe the industry is doing it this way, this industry is doing it that way, because you're doing intelligence reporting, you're doing audience intelligence, you're doing consumer behavior intelligence, you're learning along the way, right? So you do these things to understand who your audiences are. So when you look at your URL and it has all these social media links, they've all been shared through email, they've all been shared through social media, they've all been shared through a podcast, even the name of your podcast, the title of your podcast episode needs to have those semantics in there because when you hit publish if you're on spotify for podcasters or lipsyn or buzzsprout a cast captivate you know any of these big platforms right there are so many out there now if you look at the website that you're hosting that platform you realize just take a look at it and see just kick any just pick any episode you've ever published any blog you've ever published you'll realize if you didn't customize it by default, the keywords that are in the title of your podcast by default auto-generate as the URL for your website. So what are you doing here? You're doing two things. One, because you're on Spotify for podcasters or because you're on Libsyn or Buzzsprout, your podcast is there saying buzzsprout.com slash your title right so you're living on property rented property with a keyword that is created for that rss feed i'm going a little technical here so because you're in that rss feed as a lipsyn member as a spotify for podcast member as a buzzsprout member you're also adding quality and quantity to the rss feed even if it's your rss feed yes but the domain you're putting it on is different. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of cast validation, cast feed validation. Thank you so much, Liverpool. Appreciate you for being here. I know it's afternoon for you. You want to say something real quick? I just, I've really, really enjoyed this room and taken a lot from this room and everything like that. So over, but thank you um, for opening this room and continue keep up doing the good work. Yeah, so that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liverpool. Appreciate you. So guys, yes, think about your schedules. Think about your URLs. If you can do this one thing correctly, 
And what we've talked about today from your file name to your image files, to your video files, to your audio files, all of them have those keywords in there. You're building a, I can call it like a cedar tree. You're building like a, a really good tree, right? And that tree will be so, like, think about trees that have lasted for centuries, for decades, right? Those trees are not going anywhere. Digital audio is just emerging, right? So imagine what digital audio could be doing in the future. Imagine if your podcast episode, just think about this guys. Imagine if your podcast episode is a citation in a student or a college research paper and they're doing research and your podcast episode is part of the research because they're trying to find out some things. I'm just giving you like a very wild example. These are things that are happening, right? So if you have a blog that talks about something, you have an expertise in something, write that article, support it with a podcast. If you have a podcast, support it with an article. You're bridging two things together. I may not have time to read, but I may have time to watch just like a movie and a book. If you want to watch Hunger Games, or if you want to watch Star Wars, or you want to watch Lord of the Rings, you'd rather watch it than read the books. If you want to watch Harry Potter, you can read Harry Potter, but most people would rather watch the movie than read the book. Even though the book has more context or has more stories or has more scenes, the movie is what you're going to be leaning more towards because of the time factor, right? What is my investment in this 90 minutes, in this 120 minutes? So when you calculate those things and you match the same intent to how people are connecting with you, it goes a really, really long way for your business. Tina says, my goal is to hire you. I don't want to think of any of this. Um, it should be an article. What about a transcript of the episode? Yeah. So an article is just the name. You hear article, newsletter, blog, they're kind of the same thing, but they're different. I, I can put it this way and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But this is how I see it, perspective-wise. A blog is informal. It's the same thing, but when you say blog, it sounds informal. When you say article, it sounds formal, right? And then a newsletter is a little different from an article and a blog because a newsletter is more like a PSA. It's like a message in a bottle. Like, hey, here you go. Here's all the stuff that we have. And in that newsletter has individual or identical or sub-relating or correlating articles. So they kind of match together. So that's how I would phrase them. So if you're gonna put transcripts, show notes within the article, I would not just paste and say, oh yeah, all right, here's the whole transcript. No one's gonna read that. And on top of that, if you put it that way, yes, you might think it's good for SEO because there's a lot of words in there, but if there's no structure, it's worse because someone will not be able to read that. And that's why page structure is a big thing because when you write your show notes in, you know, like the caption where it says um, podcast title, podcast description, blog title, blog description, they give you a set limit of characters. And most times we don't maximize those characters. Even on LinkedIn, you have 2,500 characters in your description, but you only use 10% or 1% of it, right? But you have a whole hundred percent to use because that's where keywords live. So if you put your content in there, right? I think for Spotify for podcasters, what I do is whenever I'm putting the podcast description, I also put bold text. I put italics, I put underlines, I put links, I put anchor text. I put those things in there because I know when it goes live everywhere, not every distribution platform has the same rules. Apple has different rules from Spotify iHeart has different rules from Pandora, you know, Stitcher has different rules from Listen Notes. So you can't really judge or say what they should be doing, but because you've done your due diligence, you've put your links, you've put your attributes, you've put your content, that now becomes the show note. That's what people are using to learn more about the show because it's a show note. It's like, hey, here's a show note. I give you a note, you read it. It's about the show. I like it. I walk through the door. And by the time I walk through the door, I sit down, I like it. And I'm like, oh, this is cool because I saw the show note. So it's a note, right? So when you're creating content and you're putting that show note on a website and that website has traffic, then the reason why that website has traffic is because there are keywords in the URL, there are keywords in the title, there are keywords in the file names, and there are keywords in the copy that all say the same thing, 
and they're all pointing back to you. So if you're to do an article, I would not just do the show notes, Tina. I would be the subject matter expert, write it as a blog or as an article, and then accent the article by enhancing it with a copy of the episode as a thumbnail or as a preview or as a YouTube, if you have it on YouTube, even better, embed that video into your article, you know, give them your points, make it a listicle format, and there you go. So what happens in between that is you've created a cycle for people to learn about you in two minutes, because people are not gonna read a 20 minute transcript, but they're gonna read a two minute article. And in that two minute article, you have a 20 minute episode. So now that's 20 plus two. So now you've added a little bit of some sauce, you know, on top of what you're already giving, and then that gives them the reason for them to come back. But if you want to do transcripts, that's a whole different discussion where you can actually turn your transcripts into PDFs. And now people can actually use them if they want to like use them as a book to print. So now your transcripts become PDFs and then your articles become the show notes. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Tina, I can't wait to connect with you too, work with you whenever you're ready. Please let me know. Ryan, would you like to say anything before we go? Anything that caught your attention today? To be honest with you, Faith, there's a lot of information, but um, I've been loving it. I'm, I'm working this. Work. <laughs> You were breaking. We didn't hear what you said. Sorry. No, I said I really found it really insightful. As you've been talking, I've been working. I'm still putting stuff onto my website, so I'm doing a lot of SEO work as we obviously as you're discussing. So no, it's been really insightful. Thank you. I'm glad you're taking action. That's what I love to hear. You know, action takers are the ones who, you know, they say they're the ones who just take the cake. You know how they say early bird gets a warm. That's how it is. Like these things I'm saying are so real. Even on LinkedIn, if you go to LinkedIn and you create an, a PDF, that PDF is going to have a URL. It's going to have a title. You know, if that title doesn't hit, if it doesn't have the right keyword, it's not going to be indexed into the right filter and you won't get the right people that are reading the content you actually created for them. So you have to build the gap, bridge the gap and connect the gap so that the gap gets closer and the impact gets bigger. So I'm glad we're able to talk about this today. And if you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out to me. My email is favor at playinc.online, F-A-V-O-U-R. And if you wanna get more details as far as how it looks like, just hit on my profile and you'll see my signature there. You'll see my LinkedIn, my Pinterest, the websites. If you wanna connect further, send me a message here and I'll connect with you. If you wanna to get to work and if you want us to get your business started and want to, you just want to see things happen for you, the link is right above and you can also connect as well. So thank you so much for joining. Hey D, welcome to the room. We're just about to wrap up, hope you're okay. Thanks for joining guys. This was a great topic and the replays are available. Please listen to them. Please, please, please listen to them and take action. So when you take action, then somebody can see the action that you took because that action, there's no reaction or response. So thank you, Ryan, Tina, Austin, Cuckoo, Julie, D, Sack, and Sister Girl. Thank you for being here. Have a blessed weekend ahead and I'm gonna see you guys. I might be here over the weekend, we'll see. But definitely next week, Monday, I'll be here. But you might see me here tomorrow or Saturday. So stay tuned for that.